So we've talked, we've turned it to um, um, uh, the create, just to talk about uh, creativity in general without the brunch bit. Um, and today, um, as opposed to previous years, looking at um, individual creativity across different fields, we thought we'd look at um, creative collaborations, um, which is, um, I think, a, a growing segment of uh, creativity in general, where people are working with one another. I remember when I had a gallery, one of my painters was um, envious. Um, she had uh, collaborative envy because all of her, a lot of her friends were working on video um, artworks and they got to uh, collaborate like Joan and Josh do in creating the, uh, the end uh, piece. But as a painter, she was alone in her studio and so she did a, a collaborative painting show where each artist collaborated with one, two other artists to create um, a painting done by two people. Um, and it was a fantastic show and I have one of those works hanging in my, um, uh, in my uh, lounge room. Um, <clears throat> and I remember thinking then that it was interesting that, uh, that the artists um, hungered after collaboration. So we've got a number of um, thirst quenching collaborators here. Um, and um, we're going to start by uh, just having a chat about getting them to talk each about their, um, uh, how they collaborate, um, what they like about collaborating, um, and then um, at the end we'll throw, of course, to questions from you and have a chat amongst us as well about, about the uh, creative process and how collaboration fits into the whole scheme of things. So we've got um, Amelia and Isabel who work together as architects, um, I think uh, we were just saying, interestingly, um, it's quite unusual, particularly for two women architects to collaborate um, or to have a collaborative practice. Um, um, and we can talk a bit about that. Joan, Roche and Joan Ross and Josh Raymond um, collaborate together to create uh, Joan's uh, video works. Um, and also Nick Wales, who's a, um, who has no slides because he's a composer. Um, although he has worked with visual artists as well as recently and, and very notably working with um, uh, Sydney Dance Company and uh, Raphael, the uh, director there on their quite amazing um, recent uh, full-length piece. Um, but we're going to start, I think, with um, Amelia and Isabel. And I'll give you that in case you want to, um, to uh, move the slides yourself. This, I think, is the Australian Pavilion in Venice. Yeah, so this was our project for the Architecture Biennale in Venice uh, in uh, 2016, uh, the pool, which is probably the project we're uh, most well known for, uh, and involved collaboration across uh, a number of different um, uh, people, so uh, with, with various different input um, from, we, we worked with uh, a composer and sound artist uh, on, a, on a very particular soundtrack in the space. We also worked with a radio story editor and interviewed a number of high-profile Australians about their relationship with the pool, because we're really interested in this, um, basically putting Australian architecture within a much broader creative context mm -hmm. um, and a much broader kind of cultural context as well. Um, architects are very good at talking to other architects and uh, all patting each other on the back. And we're really interested in, in the context of the Venice Biennale really speaking much more broadly to people who sometimes don't think they have something to say about architecture, but actually live and breathe architecture every day. And so the pool was a really interesting platform for that. Uh, and it was a, a quite incredible project to work on as well. So this um, is, is the installation in the space. But really, um, we always thought our collaborators on that project were as much the sort of visitors in the space as well. And people were uh, invited to take their shoes and to have a dip in the water. I can't remember if you've actually got a photo of that. Uh, uh, it's the same sort of time as the Art Biennale, it so it, it opened, Winter. yeah, it, when it's hot, yeah, so yeah. It, it opened in May um, until November. So yeah. it, at the end it gets a little bit cold, but in the hot months in Venice, uh, it was incredibly popular, especially in the afternoons. Uh, lots of young children. Uh, in fact, the American, one of the, the American kind of project manager of the American exhibition uh, thought that she could just drop her kids off there in the morning and then come <laughs> pick them back up in the afternoon. Yeah, and, and toys and other things to play with. So people would come back kind of a number of days in a row, which was really, really lovely. And then, and some people fully disrobed and actually <laughs> submerged themselves as well. So it was, it was quite interesting. 
it was actually a functioning pool that filtered and yep. coronated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. the depth that allowed it not to have a fence or too much kind of security yeah. around it. Um, but yeah, people could you could actually swim across it. Fantastic. <laughs> Shallowly. Draconian as New no, South no, Wales. Not nearly. No, 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 but we met the much. Australian. We still met the Australian regulations yeah. just because the depth is, yeah, yeah, low enough. But the Italians are also, uh, over Europeans generally are kind of freaked out by the amount of um, chlorine we put into our pools and how we're very dirty <laughs> by comparison to Europeans. <laughs> they all have to shower before they go into public pools and it's, it's much more controlled, whereas Australian pools use something like 10 times the chlorine of. Um, which is not what we had there, though. Oh, kind of yeah. hilarious. But yeah, we <laughs> didn't use a chlorine system. It was a, kind of a long story. Because one of yeah. the people that we worked with was a scent artist, um, yeah. Lynn and Tony, who had developed this quite beautiful... With Maison Balzac. As yeah. Well, a, a French What sort perfumer. of scent? Chlorine? No, it was like... It was, it was a sort of... It, we described it as kind of like petrichor, but, but, and with a bushfire as well. So it had a fiery, earthy kind of smell to it, a scent um, that was quite like the Australian bush, essentially, after a bushfire and rain. Mm. Yeah. Bit of eucalypt... Um, yeah. Yeah. So we wanted it to be something that really evoked a sense of Australia and the sort of strangeness within that international context as well. Mm. Uh, and really interestingly, we had Ian Thorpe come over and um, he opened the Australian exhibition in Venice. He was one of the people that we spoke to for the project and interviewed. And, and it was really interesting talking to Ian and he, he spoke really about the body. We weren't so interested in speaking to Ian about winning gold medals. We were really interested in about this sort of sensation of swimming and what it felt like to be this sort of amazing body in water, yeah. um, and it's one-to-one -one experience of water. And uh, he walked, when we, he came through the day before it opened, and he walked in, and he basically walked straight back out again, and said, I don't think I can go back in. And <laughs> we're, you know, we're there with sponsors, and the Australian <laughs> ambassador, and, uh, and we're like, well, we've gone to quite a lot of effort to get Ian Thorpe to, <laughs> to Venice to open our exhibition, which is a problem. Uh, and basically he said that the smell, he felt the smell of chlorine made him feel incredibly anxious, and it was like, competing and you know when he was on the world stage and it, he felt really anxious about it and then we said oh well actually there isn't chlorine we didn't use a chlorine filter in this space we used a different type of and actually that smell is actually a smell of bushfire and then he went in and he sat in the space a little bit and said actually that's the smell of my training that's the smell of when I was actually pre kind of on the world stage and more like a young mm -hmm. teenager and training in open air pools in Sydney and having this smell of bushfires in the background mm -hmm. in summer and he actually then kind of got quite into the project, and he, he, the, but his trigger had been something kind of interesting for him. So. Yeah. yeah. And can you buy that scent anymore? <laughs> you you can, it? actually. Well, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> we, um, it, we went through a process of um, sourcing what that scent might be, and there is actually a, a scent that, yeah, um, what is it called again now? I'm to, it's a dual scent. That it's yeah, it's available through Maison Balzac, who made yeah. candles, but, oh. and then Lynn and Tony also have also made it into a furniture polish and room spray and a whole lot of... Excellent. Yeah, Fair they sent everything with it. Can't, can't <laughs> yeah. escape it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I just have to ask, too, because a lot of... Um, uh, I wondered if, if you've actually ever collaborated with a, a, a recognised visual artist, as it were, mm. because um, some people have a problem with architects because we all appreciate, of course, that um, architecture is an art form in itself. Um, but I think uh, um, the Fed Square buildings down in, in Melbourne are an example of where some people think the architects got went a bit crazy and designed the building yeah. that's almost anti-art well, hanging on the walls. Yeah, at, at that's what's sort of interesting about our practice. Um, I mean, firstly, it's a collaboration with each other, but we're very open and often like to collaborate with people outside of that, and we have been collaborating with an artist particularly um, at the moment, we're working on a project with an artist, Lakyla Glee, and um, we've worked on a couple of projects with her well, previously as proposals. We approached her initially um, around a particular project, so we're very much open to that um, creative collaboration. Uh, but we do like to collaborate with a series of different um, art forms, I suppose, so, you know, mm. composers and fence artists, as we said, so broadening that range of um, people that we... Uh, collaborate with. But yeah, we've always found it very fruitful. I think, again, that's the basis of our relationship, that we feel what we bring, um, you know, and adds a richness being collaborating with people, with each yeah. other and with others more broadly. Yeah. I've worked with a couple of um, pairs of artists, uh, Sean Kader and Claire Healy, mm. and um, two wonderful young Indian artists, uh, Tugla and Tagra. And Tugla and Tagra, when they were at um, art school together, they realised um, that they thought exactly the same things at exactly the same time, and they could start a painting in opposite corners and work toward the centre, and it would meet perfectly. And they still collaborate, and they 
and they, they collaborate because they think the same, whereas Sean and Claire think almost diametrically opposed to each other. And so for them, it's a banter backwards and forwards, um, them constantly saying to each other, that's a terrible idea. You know, um, it should be like this. Or, and and, and that they find that their collaboration, out of, out of that um, um, toing and froing comes a very happy result somewhere in the middle. How is it for, for you guys, and I'll ask each of you how that works, but as architects, um, both obviously trained architects, um, do you uh, bounce ideas backwards and forward, or do you find that it flows quite sort of seamlessly in the same direction? I feel like it's a combination of both, in a way. But probably more, more the banter. We've always seen it as a dialogue, really, like we put something forward and the other one responds, and the same thing with other people. Yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes we disagree, and that, yeah. that also gets to a better... <laughs> You know, outcome sometimes as well. You know, yeah. it's not that we sort of fight it out, but I think that you know, you, and that's something we were interested in when we started our practice is that we thought we could do much more interesting work together and and um, bringing two different ideas constantly to the table. And that's why we always sort of collaborate on all our projects, even though it's sometimes not the most efficient way of working. And yeah. we think it gets a better result and a more yeah. interesting project and a more layered and nuanced response. What are some of the things you tend to dis disagree about? I think we normally agree on a bigger picture direction or, or that sort of becomes a conversation across a number of different ideas. I think one of the problems we sometimes have as a duo is too many ideas, you know, and that's yes, I think so often the case of refinement, I guess. Like put which, a lot of things on the yeah. table uh, and which ones then are kind of the most important elements of the project to take through and to develop. And, um, and then sometimes we disagree on very minor things, you know, the shade <laughs> of red or... Um, <laughs> the devil is in the detail. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, Nick, um, we'll get you to flick through perhaps another couple of you. Where is this? Oh, that's, no, that's, go back one. That's, where so is this? this? So this was the pool um, after Venice. We were in Venice for six months, and then last year we were at the NGV for six months. So we reconfigured um, and sort of uh, thought through the project within the Australian context, which was quite a different setting. And also, interestingly, we always saw our project, which was the first uh, Australian architecture exhibition in the new um, Australian Pavilion in Venice. And so we always sort of saw the pool as being a piece of Australian architecture, really, in conversation with that mm -hmm. other piece of Australian architecture. So it was interesting to bring it back and then have it in a completely different urban setting. Well, as you say, in this context, it's the Federation Square, mm. yeah. Which yeah. we really liked, the fact that it was yeah. so different, because, you know, in Venice it was a black box you know, a white cube mm. and a black box, and that was the, uh, we saw our response as a dialogue with that, and then here it was with this, yeah, in conversation with quite a crazy, you know, angular, quite a difficult space to work within, really, but we really liked that conversation, actually, with the street and the public as well, because it was open directly onto the public domain. Isn't that square. foyer space? Yeah, in Ian Potter, so the design yeah. centre, yeah, which, so it meant that people would walk straight in off the street, which, again, it became a bit like a little public pool space, apparently, every Sunday, um, mothers would turn up with their kids or families would turn up so they could have a splash around. So it was, it was like a little public pool space, pool space on, the, on the square, which was nice. Excellent, great. Um, Nick, we can, might move to you now. I don't think you've got anything, but can you <laughs> hum a tune or something for us? Um, tell us a bit about some of the collaborations you've, you've had, obviously with RAF recently, which was very successful. Um, and, and I'd like to hear about some of the collaborations with visual artists as well. I've done nine work with Sydney Dance Company and Raphael, including the nude show at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. I don't know if anyone saw that one. Yeah. Um, what did you do for the nude show? Contributed some music, yeah. Was that for when the dancers were dancing When they were dancing, the I didn't get nude. No, no okay. <laughs> but some people did, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I've done quite a lot of um, work in contemporary dance and theatre and film work and I've collaborated with a few visual artists, um, Justin Shoulder, um, Lauren Brinkat, and Hayden Fowler. And I think it, working within the visual arts context, a composer is usually brought in when there is time involved. Mm -hmm. So video work or performance work or mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. When you, when you were talking about the nature of collaboration, I, I kind of, over the years, I've found it really important to kind of remove the sense of self from the work or from, from the process and really concentrate on the work itself. And I, most of the most successful collaborations I've had are when 
It's not about this is my idea, this is your idea. It's just about it's taking the me and you or us out of it and it's just about the, the thing and trying to make that as good as it can. Sometimes um, I've just finished a, a work with a fellow composer, Brie Van Rijk, and there's some p parts of that work that she really did most of it yeah. and I did m most of some part of it and I did most of another part of it, but it's that sort of um, ebbing and flowing that I is think it, is really is important. Is that easier when, when you've got somebody else's work to work from and it's not so much about perhaps personally expressing yourself? Is that easier or? Uh, I think it's, it's always really good to have someone to work with. It's a very lonely road being an, an artist sometimes. So often it's like, hey, let's do something together. And that's really exciting to have other ideas. And the sum of the parts are often mm. greater than then, you know, there, there can be a sort of um, kinetic um, explosion around yeah. an idea that you can't, that's sort of intangible and that's quite exciting. Yeah. Um, and when you're working with the visual artist, um, were you sort of presented with like uh, sort of complete work on their part that you no. put music to or did you work together? No, uh, together? with a lot of, some contemporary dance and some visual art, it's the, the piece is finished or not even begun. So sometimes I'll provide the music for the dance. Sometimes the, the a, a visual film will be edited and I'll put the music to that. Other times, like when I worked with Hayden, he contacted me because I've worked with a few Aboriginal singers from North East, Northeast Arnhem Land. And he contacted me because he was doing a work around a Maori, um, folklore around the eel, um, which in the, ri in the river, rivers in New Zealand, the eel is sort of the, the queen of the river, a little bit like the rainbow serpent in Australia. That's what I sort of gathered from talking to him. Mm -hmm. So I was just sort of working, looking at these really mundane <laughs> kind of 3D renders of, it was gonna be a 3D immersive yeah. film yeah, okay. thing. And I just had to kind of imagine that. And it, it's just trying to find the, how, how in working with him, it's how was I gonna try to express the depth of culture and feeling that he wanted to convey. So it was really clear to us that we had to work with a traditional Maori singer. And she brought all these beautiful songs about the eel to the studio and she sang them and she was so great. She was like, I'm not a singer. Like she, she was pretty much just this lady from Campbelltown who came in and had the most beautiful voice and just sang these gorgeous eel songs. And so that was, that sort of formed a kind of um, strong structure for us, cultural structure in the work. And then I had, had the, um, was given the artistic liberty to um, mm -hmm. and combined I guess, with um, Hayden's vision. And in that, in that context with working with somebody um, of a particular and very different culture, you have to be very respectful yeah. to work within the parameters that they define? Yeah, often it's just about having that respect, asking the right questions and having permission. Yeah. Not, never sort of trudging over anything. And not making assumptions. No assumptions, um, just being like a, a nice person, <laughs> I think. <laughs> you know, yeah. just being aware and yeah. um, like Rowan is a um, song man from North East, North East Arnhem Land and I worked with, a, with him on a finale for a Sydney Dance Company show and it was a very interesting um, thing for Raphael for me to bring this in and it just felt like the right, it just sort of came in and I met him, it's like, let's do this. And we were very conscious and almost tippy-toeing tippy around the cultural sensitivity. But when I spoke to Ruan and when he spoke to his elders, they, they have such a grace around their culture and they, they say, 
We want to share this with the world. This is the best thing that can happen to our culture. Please, mm. please use, mm. use our um, song mm. and... Um, Just acknowledge it. Acknowledge well. it and... Yeah. Um, but they... Yeah, they they just have this beautiful grace around mm. sharing sharing their culture. Fantastic, like like you did with the cool Australian culture, taking it gracefully to uh, to Europe to share yeah. um, with them. Um, Joan and Josh, where's that clicker? There we go. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Colour and movement, the essence of entertainment. <laughs> Um, so this is this is the a work that you can see here at the fair. It's in um, Ma uh, Michael Reed's booth, uh, and I think was finished on Tuesday night, wasn't it? Mm, around eleven thirty. Yeah, right there. Um, and it's fantastic. It's a sort of exploration of an idea um, uh, behind a work that you won the Sulman for last year, um, and um, you collaborate with with Josh who's another, of course, fantastic artist in his own right. Um, you can tell by his shot, socks and shoes. Um, it's a sympathetic socks, really, yeah. for Joan. Yeah. Um, and um, and how, does your, how does your collaboration work? How do you guys bounce off one another? Look, I feel like I, um, Josh is a box, and I'm like this... Mess. Mess. <laughs> and he contains me, and he asks all the right questions, and takes me in all the right directions. And I couldn't do it without him, mm. not at all. And we actually uh, spent a lot of time together. We spent like two months together. I, I yeah. think that I was listening to a, a great Kentridge show, that's just William Kentridge show that's opened at the, at the gallery of the Archives of New South Wales. And I took some students there. I teach in the architecture faculty at uh, the University of Sydney, um, in a, a small way. Uh, with some second year students, but K Kentridge has this great idea that you, there are certain things you don't need to sort of set down or establish actually before you move ahead, and he sort of gives over to the process of, of making. Um, and then post that, once you have some work, you kind of excavate and start asking questions. So it's sort of in reverse, uh, and, and he mm. you know, exactly sort of describes it like that. And I think that's kind of our approach mm. in that, and I said this you know, before about a context for working that, certainly with Joan, is that you, we make a, a sort of a conceptual sandbox that lets ideas be explored. And I think we kind of, we, we do that and then we, we see what we get. And that might happen just on a daily basis in terms of smashing stuff together and, and seeing what it is. Um, and then it happens on a grander scale once you've kind of got this, certainly in the case of video, this longer duration and these multiple things being thrown up against each other. So we, we kind of throw stuff around and, and I, um, you know, I, I also, had, I don't have the same sort of conceptual investments. It's not, you know, when I make my own work, I'm not making animation and I'm, I don't have such a direct connection to, you know, colonialism or those sort of products uh, as such, like colonial sort of products. So it's, it's easy in that sense. Um, and we, we had this conversation the other day about actually we're terrible collaborators, really, in one <laughs> sense, because we, we've got a, like a very sort of narrow oh, no, this works terrible. way in which <laughs> we'll do it. Be, you know, there are certain things we'll give up and certain things we won't. And mm. so we kind of tussle and, and kind of don't at the, at the same time, I think. Um, I mean, the, the other thing it's about More of a it, mud wrestle than it is a, a sandbox. Yeah. <laughs> you know, things get spilt. Um, <laughs> And we eat a lot of toast, and um, but I, it, it is a mysterious process, and it, it sort of it doesn't really belie t too much analysis in one sense, at, at least while you're in it. I think um, that I spent the first two weeks being thankful and very grateful to Josh's patience with me, because when I go into a work, I don't have a storyboard. I could pretend to have one, but I don't have one at all, and it's it's annoying to me as much as it is to anyone else. And Josh and I have done quite a number of works together now. And, but, I, but his patience with me, because I react, the way that I work is I see a, something in front of me and then I react to it one way or another. Or I, and as soon as I see the next section, I start, everything starts to move and play. And, and um, so we have to work like that, actually. Mm. 
Has it got easier um, over time because you are, you know, obviously more and more used to one another? I suppose. I mean, there's a real, we're, we're, you know, there's a real honesty. There's a real ease. Um, I think the honesty is important. And um, yeah, we just we we say when it's not working, I or when we've had enough, or when it, you know, when it. I mean, video and and you know this kind of stuff that's so tech-based. It you know, it, there's a whole range of conventions and things which are quite useful, like storyboarding, like like pre-production, that sort of stuff. And and when you're in a potentially a visual arts context, you you don't have a lot of that. So you've got to be very flexible and uh, um, tr make it as spontaneous and reactive as possible. Um, I mean, mm. that starts to wear thin when you've just got to get things up and rendered mm. and mm. You sign off and move on, you know. Um, but I think what's really important is that we're not collaborating with the ideas in a certain way. It's my concept, but Josh has to is fully with me and totally understands what I'm doing. Um, you know, but I, the one thing that I do keep as my structure is the concept. Um, knowing what it is I'm actually trying to say, even though I don't know how I'm going to say it mm. um, at each moment. And, you know, so when we get to, we get to situations like this. Hmm. That's beautiful. That's the best frame in it. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, uh, this is just looking at some of the elements in that third room of the video. If you haven't seen the video, uh, go to Michael Reeves and have a look. Um, and this is just some of the elements. There's, there's thousands and thousands of movements and images in the work. Um, and we're always negotiating because that will affect that. And so it's not... Is that the back end, the back end of... Yeah. Um, so in this room, for example, <clears throat> you know, the ham smashes the glass, and the whole conversations are around how the glass smashes, how, how it gets smashed. And so, you know, we'll spend a whole day trying to get the glass to smash, to get the bird's wings to flap, to get people to talk and wink and, you know. And this room, if you looked at that room in comparison to the other one with those arrows, you'd see a, you wouldn't be able to see the room because of how many arrows would be in that room. And so, obviously, um, Josh is, is uh, the tech mastermind behind it, and yours are the, the, um, the conceptual framework, but I also get the impression that, that Josh is a, is, a, is a sounding board as well for your ideas and, and gives you a bit of perspective on, on, on some of the things that you come up with. Yeah. He's amazing. Like in the beginning, it was like, um, I want to go through a museum. I want it to be a flooded museum. And he starts asking questions like, how many rooms has the museum got? Uh, and it's like, you've got till tomorrow afternoon to know how many rooms. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then it's like, and what does that room look like? And it's like, I don't know. And then, it, and, you know, and he always asks me the right questions and we... Like a therapist, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I've worked a lot in that capacity. I worked for, you know, many years. I you know, went to school with Sean Gladwell and, you know, side mm. by side on, on, you know, all of all of his stuff, obviously major stuff leading up to Venice and things. And so, uh, you know, I, it's been a large part of how mm. I work with other people mm. um, is bringing that kind of... Um, support, I suppose. Mm. Um, uh, it's, you all you know, do it's pleasurable. It's, I'd say it's, it's not this kind of uh, uh, intensive um, navel-gazing in terms of process and, uh, mm. you know, structure. Um, it, it obviously comes out of relationships and very sort of yeah. often just banal sorts of things, you know, yeah. circumstance and, uh, you know, happenstance. Mm. Um, you do all strike me as reasonably calm, except for Joan, of course reasonably calm people, is, there, is, is, is that um, a necessary component to, to being able to collaborate, is, is um, a level of calm? I don't know the word that calm yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we're calm. I, think that, I did um, put a little bit of uh, <laughs> Valium in the coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After all, coffees us, were quite yeah. calm. Yeah. Um, I think that, as someone told us about the years, like it is about building relationships over a period of time, and that's why there's been a couple of people that we've returned to over time because sometimes an architecture project can go on for a really long time as well as mm. just to build a building takes quite some time. 
Uh, and even these kind of projects like Venice, which is a sort of more exhibition-based project, you know, it takes a lot of time. And so sometimes it's a conversation that we start, uh, like with Michaela, that we start on one project and then actually I think we're up to Paris, so yes, maybe four the fourth or, five. or fifth project <laughs> Until we've it actually discussed sticks. something with and it's actually not materialised yet. Yeah. But it, yeah, these sort of conversations we've had across other projects then feed into into the others. So yeah. mm. we yeah, should also disagreements on some projects then are, are yeah. taken up as challenges on others. So. Mm. Amelia and I worked together as well for seven years in another company before we then started our collaborative. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a fairly, together. and I imagine the collaborative process gets easier the longer you're, you've yeah. spent collaborating with somebody because you know the quirks and yeah, exactly, the and it can kind of shortcut the, the project because yeah. you know what yeah. that person is thinking yeah. <laughs> already. How long have you been collaborating with Raphael at Sydney Dance Company? Uh, six, seven years. Yeah, and uh, that's become easier over time. Yeah, it has. Um, he kind of just lets me go, and I let him go. Uh huh. That doesn't sound, that sounds like a, an interesting collaborative process. Yeah. yeah. Well, how, how does that work, actually? Sometimes. I mean, I think collaboration is all about trust. Yeah. Uh, and giving the trust and the creative freedom to the other person, because mm. if you're too prescriptive in in what you want, then you even the way you, you do it, I guess you sort of cut the wings of the collaborator. Mm. Mm. I agree. I if think that's to a successful collaboration is actually allowing that person or trusting yeah, that person to do that bit and know that they'll deliver a good result as well. Mm. Yeah. And, and respect that they bring another layer of, mm. of thinking to the project as well that is more than what you could do on your own. Yeah. yeah. We do world. have some fights. <laughs> good. <laughs> Not really fights, but... Um, yeah. And how do you sure resolve that. those when, when, you, when you've got a very strong clash of ideas? Well, it's usually... Um, with Raph's working with Raphael, it's a very balletic process in, in that the music is written first and then the dance is done to that. Although it's not done to that, he works without music for a time. Um, we, we, there's always an overarching um, concept that we're both working towards and he develops the dance separate from the music and I've developed the music separate from the dance and then it sort of all comes together at one point and I add a little bit more here or there or some things are working better so I extend sections or cut sections. Um, so that's with him but other theatrical works are different. I find that kind of really interesting that, that you write the music first or independently and, the, and then he's doing the dance independently and they somehow come together. Does he give you a, um, an idea of what he wants from the music, like, you know, bombast or calm or like a river flowing? What does um, he say to you? He just usually says, I want it to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it easy. Um, <laughs> Go away. Well, he said it, it's, well, it's kind of interesting because it's working with him and Sydney Dance Company, you're also working with an... Uh, sort of idea of marketing. So I, often Raph does these neoclassical works working with composers like Bach and um, very classical Australian chamber orchestra music um, live and very classical. And so he engages me to be the antithesis of that. So I come to the project knowing he wants abstract, electronic, dark, edgy, um, in your face yeah. stuff. Yeah. So uh, from the outset, I know I'm not going to be using too many strings. I'm not going to, so, mm. and that's sort of also a part of his process that he's trying to offer, and we're all trying to offer something different for audiences mm. over the years. So it's not just one thing. And Because, mm. um, I mean, the piece earlier this year, the full, what's it called, et al, wasn't it? Um, ab intra. Yeah, ab intra. So that was like a full-length piece. It's like 90 minutes or two hours long. Um, so I can't imagine, but tell me if I'm wrong, that he just says to you, do two hours of music, and then he comes back and plonks dance on top of it. Is there, must, is there a, a toing and froing? I mean, you, do you write two hours of music straight up, or? I uh, usually, I mean, that was interesting, because I knew I, could, I had the, I've written a lot of string orchestral music, and I knew I had the capacity to, 
with that work, we wanted to bring the hard electronic art and the classicism together mm -hmm. to combine these two worlds. And that's the sort of framework he sets up for you. Yeah. yeah. And I got really excited. And I got this cellist, Julian, from the Australian Chamber Orchestra, and I started writing all this orchestral music and or just um, classically influenced music. And Raph comes in and saying, no. Sort of Not amazing. He wanted to hear, like, and you just sort of, and there's, I don't, collaborations and about relationships. So it's like, okay, I'll just leave that on the hard drive. Hmm. So I just start on a new abstract electronic thing. He falls in love with it. Get on with that. And then he comes into the studio one day and I'm like, what about this? <laughs> the thing I played him first. And, he, and he's, once he's heard this electronic stuff, he's like, oh, I love that. <laughs> and so then a new, yeah. a new. Um, yeah. So there is a lot of to and fro and hiding and re, reintroducing. It's just loving or hating, really. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have to do that, Josh, with Joan? Hide stuff and then bring it back when she's forgotten? Definitely, <laughs> constantly. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, both, you know, both your experiences are a bit faulty in that anyway. So the things that I think she might want and things that she doesn't or, you know, or things that I might sort of maybe subconsciously want to push, uh, they, they just, they, they, those things don't meet, you know. They, they, well, like, not a, I, was made, I went and made a pie the other night when I came back in. <laughs> He'd done this completely different thing, and it was like. Did I ruin it? Probably. Well, it was. Oh, it, yeah. it became an. You know, it was like. I, I, I shouldn't yeah. have left the room. <laughs> Should have made that. Never made a pie for me. <laughs> <laughs> Need to do more work at the computer. Yeah. <laughs> and and what what exactly was that that he'd done that was wrong? What about it was wrong? It was we were building up to being needing like. It, this work is very intense, like as it builds up, it, the renders of each section are taking 12, 14, one says 56 hours, you know, you've got two days left. Um, it, it's, very, it be, it's becoming very intense, <clears throat> so I get up to make the pie. We're doing <laughs> this is an example. Um, we what were kind hungry. of pie was it? It was, it was a spinach and cheese pie. Oh, yum. Yeah. Mm. And, um, in my video, we have a dog ad, uh, a, a, an ad for... Um, dog bliss, happiness pills. Dog happiness pills for humans. And um, Josh had not liked the font, and so he'd like, redone it. <laughs> and, uh, and you preferred the original font? A little, or something, anyway. And wouldn't give him any pie until he turned it back again, is that right? I was denied pie, probably, <laughs> <laughs> until I changed it back. Or we, no, did, we did change it, though, in the end. We did change it. It's only that... You know, I mean, for me, I had a concept of what a, a, the dog happiness pill um, ad would look like and how it would run. And sometimes the, the worst thing for me is it's not until it's been changed that I realise I don't like it. Uh, and, you know, and I think in that level, you know, uh, egos are a really interesting thing in this process because everyone has to drop them at different times and there's some things you just want to hold a little tighter. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, I couldn't let go of that one so much. And you're both invest, you know, invested in different sorts of ways and capacities as well. So, it, it, yeah, it does get... Uh, well, it gets messy. And I think it, you also... If, if you think of yourself as being sort of particularly open or, um, you know, you're able to communicate honestly about how you feel and what's going on, even then, even if you get to that point, I think the ability to still be understood and to speak clearly is a really difficult thing. And so part of, I think, what is constantly going on is this sort of, uh, yeah, translation and, mm. do, you know, do, is that when she says that, does she mean what she says she means or have I not, misinterpreted not it? See, I know. <laughs> yeah. so I'm, it, not this, good at, I'm not good at articulating something. No, but uh, but the, the, thing, the thing that matters is that you kind of constantly pull that apart a bit and, yeah. and, and work with it because, mm. yeah, you, you can't just run with... And gesticulation, stuff. obviously, seems There's to be a big, big part <laughs> of it as well. <laughs> And how about you guys? Have you ever hidden stuff and brought it back later? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Isabel's, Isabel's not very good at letting things go. No, that's um, true. Which is 
Well, she's also, you mentioned before about Lena, it's like, it's due in three hours. And I'm like, okay, this is it. This is it now. We have to lock this it in. This is why it's good. We have to press and print. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I need someone to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Normally we yeah. send her off to get like dinner at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee, something. Excellent. Oh, well, yeah. um, I, I think it's almost time to throw it open to the audience for questions. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question for our collaborators? Yes. There's two there. Uh, go for it there. The le is that Jan? Jan? Yep. Yes, it was something that the girls mentioned say. earlier when we were talking that um, that 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 was un it was unusual. Mm. It's unusual as a business model with two female directors. And maybe that's just head. at the point of time that we're at. Maybe it will become less unusual. But the, it does seem to be, and it certainly was never something that we really thought about when we decided to start the firm together. Um, it just became more apparent to us as we started going that people would pick up on that fact and note it. Mm. Um, yeah, it is much more usual for women to practice as a couple, for instance, um, or, uh, or singularly. You know, or singularly, exactly. So it's yeah. solo mm. head of the practice. Mm. Yeah. And, and interestingly, with Venice as well, we collaborated with Michelle Tabbott as well on that project, who uh, is not an architect, but sort of an urban strategist, also not originally Australian. She grew up in Paris um, and sort of has American heritage, so she's sort of quite international. So it was really interesting that we always had this sort of external voice within that, but we were three young-ish women for architecture. Um, so yeah, it's quite an interesting process. We're quite open in a sense and I feel like that means that we push the boundaries a bit more perhaps because I feel like um, perhaps I mean obviously it depends on individuals more than anything but a, a lot of um, I'm trying not to <laughs> generalize here because I'm sure I say something along the way but um, <laughs> the males no, I mean, are often quite ego driven though I feel mm -hmm. like we're not so and and perhaps that's representative of why we started a practice together I think um, to start one solely you have to be quite ego driven and to have started one together means that we feel that there's something else that the other person is bringing. And I think that's very important to our practice as well. I don't know whether that is necessarily particularly um, a female no, I trait. Th I think that that's sort of fair enough to, mm. in terms of generalization, obviously generalizations break down on the individual level mm. um, and mean nothing. But if I guess if you look at the generalizations about the differences hitherto between men and women, one of them is... Um, uh, women are, are better, perhaps even just linguistically uh, communicating, and also more in touch with their feelings. Um, mm. and, and men, um, uh, you know, tend to be um, sort of driven by the idea of the pyramid with the men at the top. Mm. Um, so I, I, I think that's probably a fair enough generalization. Mm. And hopefully, I think um, as people talk about these uh, generalizations, they, they become uh, less. Uh, Mm. over time. I think another, sorry. Mm. Another, oh. go. <laughs> there was something in Venice as well that I think um, was this incredible opportunity. A, you sort of mentioned Venice being an Irish people and they go, oh yeah, I'll be part of that. That's really <laughs> interesting. So we, and also being relatively unknown um, and a sort of practice no one had ever heard of before and, and sort of considered young within the profession. It was quite interesting that I think that we were able to open doors where people were incredibly generous with us, mm. with their time mm. and we weren't perceived as a threat sometimes to people yeah. as well. So I think there was an opportunity for us to reach out to people. Um, Paul Kelly, for example, we actually uh, got in touch with through Bree 
uh, and he was amazing and, and just, mm. you know, gave us his time and, and I just incredible insight into the project. Mm. People are very generous. I think as well because there are two of us too, it, it's clear that it's, well, not clear necessarily, but it, it does feel less ego driven that we are very open to this idea of what other people can bring to the practice. Mm. And I think often as well, and I, I hope this will change progressively, but I think for a lot of women perhaps they feel threatened by other women and because there is this sense of competitiveness and I, I think that is very hard for a lot of, because, you know, it's, it, it's a difficult space to be in still at this point in architecture. Mm. You really have to prove yourself um, to push yourself forward. Um, so I, I feel hopefully that, and I do feel like this is happening more and more, that women are becoming more and more supportive of each other, of each other rather than feeling so threatened. Mm. Mm. That's, a good, that's a good outcome. C collaboration ends up being this sort of odd um, anomaly because the sort of prevailing expectation is that there's a singular kind of, usually male genius there, you know, at the drafting board or in the visual arts behind a palette or something. You know, these are old sort of models of how, of the production of stuff. And I think collaboration kind of, it, it makes that, it makes stuff messy uh, in, in both an interesting way, but also sort of a confusing way about, you know, authorship and, mm. and uh, e effort and labour and all of the, you know, all the sorts of stuff you, you know, we're mm. sort of touching on. I mean, the name of our practice, for example, is, is we combined our middle names into a sort of a persona that people often, which is Eileen Sage Architects, and so people sort of say, well, where's yeah, Eileen Sage right. and why isn't she at my <laughs> very important client meeting? And we're sort of like, well, that's kind of us and, 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 and neither of us as well. Yeah. And so even that, I think, is sort of surprising to people and yeah. it's not potentially something maybe yeah. two male collaborators would have yeah. done. You know, it's the kind of classic architecture practice would be our last names and it yeah. was really us, really identity. Sage is great being in there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Usually thought of as male, I think, but, yeah. but uh, good, good that there is a, a sage in amongst it. Yeah. Um, what about in, um, when collaborating with another man? Have you ever found, I imagine knowing Raph, he's a, a quite uh, a good collaborator, being a nice guy, as you, as yeah. you pointed out. But um, is there any uh, sort of clash of egos that ever happened? Oh, there that? has been one um, collaborator that it's gotten pretty heated. Um, is that because they didn't respect what you had done? Or was it um, lack of respect no, it's not about um, lack of respect. It's more about control. Mm -hmm. um, they want to control your every image. element. Yeah. Like the, oh, that would be me, yeah. the <laughs> archetypal <laughs> director who yeah. wants to have, have a finger in every piece of every pie. And then what's the point of collaborating? In a way, it sort of gets a bit tiresome. Mm. Um, yeah. And is that the problem you have with Joan? Constantly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there was another question up the back there. Josh and Joe, how, how do you maintain? I don't have anything formal. I think that, that idea that there's a things work because there's a trust. I think you know that's established, and we motor along without too many uh, sort of um, evaluation, sort of you know yeah you know audits. Um, I think it's I mean, because it's, all, it's happening all the time. The evaluation audit for me is happening happening continuously. I know anything um, because we'll throw things in like oh should we have a spider? Um, <laughs> for example, and uh, um, I spent actually the whole first three weeks or something saying, um, coming into this video saying, are we in a canoe? Am I a Barbie doll or a turtle? You know, I didn't actually know who I was coming in that room and, you know, but consistently evaluating who am I, what does this mean? Every single image and there were thousands of them in this video. Every single image, every single colour, um, for me, will be evaluated at every step. At every way. step. And as soon as there was something that was jarring or wrong, it, either of us would notice and we would, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this was pretty much almost 24-7 over the last few weeks. 
going to 25, was, 28 cents. There was, there was some late night pies yeah. being yeah. made. It was, yeah. as all these things demand, yeah. you know, you've got to ramp it up towards the end. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we too old to work through the night. Yeah. Um, but, but, um, but you were, you know, in terms of the, the question, you know, you, it was so constant that you didn't, you were always on the same page because you were at it almost uh, all the time. With you guys, um, you must, I imagine uh, you've got various different projects going. Yeah. So how do you maintain that sort of same page thing on one particular project? Very practically, we, we sit right next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're really lucky that right at the beginning of our practice, we had um, a space to go work with, so we weren't working necessarily from our kitchen table. Uh, we had a City of Sydney kind of creative space that we were lucky to um, be part of. And so it, it's always been really important for us to have a studio space and to yeah, basically sit right next to each other and we kind of have a shared bit between us, which is where we constantly are kind of printing things out and scribbling over the top of them and talking over them mm. and, and are doing that all, yeah. all day and kind of yeah. Yeah, constantly kind of bouncing things off each other. So just at a really practical level, yeah. constant talking through our ideas when it's yeah, each exactly. other. And yeah. making sure they're on the same page, looking at different yeah. images, making different models and you yeah. know, mm. digitally and physically as well yeah. to mm. kind of discuss. And then yeah. I think also we sort of do slight shifts as well. I'm definitely more a morning person and Isabel's more of a nighttime person, so sometimes She's just going to sleep as I wake up, point. and then um, <laughs> someone has to press print at 10 a.m. and yeah. that will be me. Um, <laughs> and, and Nick, how do you maintain that sort of um, same pageness? Usually, uh, if I'm working with someone new, I'll ask them what kind of music they like, what kind of music they're imagining. Um, often, taste can come in with if you're working with a non-musician. They often have a very difficult way of describing music or talking about music or they lack a language around it. So it's just kind of gauging, oh, what do you like? What, what, have, you, what have you heard that's interesting to you? Just so that you kind of can, so that it's apples or oranges. Yeah, really. it's not coming out of left field yeah. and completely strange. Yeah. 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 And then through that collaborative process, you just maintain communication, um, sh constantly um, showing them what you've come up with. Yeah, there's always the first really nerve-wracking, you send it off mm -hmm. um, moment. And usually it, it, it all works out. Yeah. But it's, it's all about relationships and communication at the yes. end of the day. Yeah. Because the amazing thing is if there's something that I really believe in and then and the collaborator I'm working with, they're not seeing it, you come up with something even better mm. through that push and pull. Um, sometimes amazing results can happen through um, difference in, in vision. Mm. Fantastic. Have we got any other questions? We're almost out of time, but time for another question or two. I would like to thank you all for, um, for coming and uh, sharing your insights with us. Um, and uh, I'd appreciate if you guys gave our panelists a round of applause.